Today we present a model of verification in mechanism design that's explicitly based upon testing. And we show that using testing resolves some of the difficulties that have been presented by earlier, more reduced form approaches. This is joint work with Dennis Kopfinkel, who's here in the audience. In the standard paradigm of mechanism design, it's assumed that every type can send every message. But in practice, we often see many examples where reports are verified. Just to take one example, think about insurance claims. If someone claims that they have a disability and seeking disability insurance, the insurer will perform a medical test to determine their eligibility for that benefit. <clears throat> the standard way of modeling verification in mechanism design began with Green and LaFont in 1986, and their approach has since become standard. What they do is they exogenously restrict which reports each type can make. So I want to start here with a simple three-type example that captures their idea. Each edge of the graph goes from a type to a feasible report. So here, for instance, type two can report his type as type two, or he can report type three. Type three can only report type three. And let's consider a very simple problem where the principal is deciding whether to allocate a good to an agent who has one of these three types. And the agent, regardless of his type, likes the good. And there are no transfers. Let's suppose that the principal would like to allocate the good to the agent if and only if the agent is type two or type three. Now a natural approach, if we're used to the revelation principle, would be, well, let's just give the agent the good if he reports that he's type two or if he reports that he's type three. There's a problem here, though, because in this case, agent one, if the agent is type one, he, he still likes the good, and he can report type two and get the good. So this is not going to be truthfully implementable. But it will be implementable if we do it like this. We say, report your type. If you can say type three, if you report type three, you'll receive the good. Otherwise, you won't. And here we see that both type two and type three are capable of reporting type three, but type one is not. This was a very famous example that concerned a lot of uh, economists who are very comfortable and familiar with the revelation principle. And today, we'd like to reinterpret the example and view it not so much as a failure of the revelation principle, but as a property of testing. So here, we think of each report as essentially a statistical test that only certain types can pass. And in this case, we see that reporting type theta 2 is not the best test to distinguish type theta 2 from all other types. We're going to present a model that explicitly references tests that have a probabilistic outcome. And I'll connect our model to more recent literature in CS on probabilistic verification later in the talk. So let's jump into the model. We start with a very standard principal agent setting. The principal has commitment power. The agent draws a private type, theta, from some common distribution. And the principal controls decisions, which we call x. x is completely abstract. It may or may not include transfers as one component. And the principal and the agent both have preferences over these decisions that depend on the agent's private type. So to that very standard setting, what's novel in this paper is the testing technology. A testing technology is specified by two objects. First, a set T of pass-fail tests, and then a passage rate, pi, which specifies the probability that each type can pass each test. The principal is able to conduct one test from this set. And I want to walk through the procedure for conducting tests. So let's suppose an agent who is type theta is given test tau. The agent has a choice. The agent makes a binary effort choice, either exerting effort on the test or not. This, we call this effort, but it's important to keep in mind effort is costless here. It's just a, a choice whether to essentially try on the test or not. If the agent doesn't exert effort, then he fails with certainty, and we denote failure by zero. And if the agent does exert effort on the test, then his passage probability is as specified by this passage rate, pi. So pi of tau given theta is the probability of passage and the complementary probability of failure. The principal sees the test result, but not the agent's effort. So in particular, these two nodes at the bottom, these two zeros, are indistinguishable from the standpoint of the principal. Now let me describe the timing. This is sort of a big slide with a lot on it, so let's go through it slowly. 
First, nature draws the agent's type, theta. Then the agent, knowing his type, sends a message to the principal. The principal then selects a test. The agent sees this test and chooses effort. Next, nature draws the test result, which is either pass or fail. Remember, we're denoting this one for pass, zero for fail. And the distribution, the distribution from which nature draws is going to depend on the agent's true type and on whether the agent is exerting effort. And then finally, the principal is going to take a decision. So now that we have the, the timeline, let me define the formal objects. The principal has commitment power. So the principal first selects a mechanism, commits to a mechanism, which has three components. The first is the message space M. Then we have a testing rule, which assigns a test distribution to each message. I say distribution because this means that the principal can commit to randomize over which test is performed. And then finally, the principal takes a decision, again, can be stochastic, that's based on the message the agent sent, the test that's performed, and then the result of this test, either pass or fail. Given this mechanism, the agent now chooses a strategy. The agent faces a dynamic decision problem, and the strategy has two components. First, the agent chooses what message to send as a function of his type. And then, after seeing the test, receiving a test, the agent chooses the probability with which to exert effort on this test. And this probability can depend on the agent's true type, his private information, the message he sent, and the test that the principal has selected. Any questions on these topics? So now that we have the model in place, just a few simple definitions, and then we can move on to the results. We're interested in implementable social choice functions. A social choice function assigns a distribution of decisions to each type. And we say that a mechanism, together with a strategy, implements a social choice function if two conditions are satisfied. First, the strategy must be a best response for the agent, given the mechanism. This means that it maximizes the agent's expected utility over his set of strategies. And next, this, the composition of the strategy and the mechanism must yield the function f. We could just write this out as a formula, but I didn't want to go into the details. And of course, a social choice function f is called implementable if it's implemented by some mechanism and strategy. So now let's turn to the results. First, we establish the revelation principle. This may seem kind of boring, but again, remember the example. This doesn't always hold with verification. So to state the, the principle, let me first define what I mean by canonical implementation. We say that implementation is canonical if the mechanism is direct. This means that messages correspond to type reports. Another way of saying it is the message space M is just the type space theta. The agent reports truthfully. These are the two standard notions you're probably familiar with. But now we have a third, which is that the agent exerts effort on every test. Because our model separates communication from testing, we're able to establish the revelation principle in this standard form. Every implementable social choice function is canonically implementable. And this means when we're searching for implementable social choice functions, the agent, we can pin down without loss the agent strategy and only optimize over mechanisms subject to incentive constraints. The challenge in this setting, though, is that mechanisms are very complicated. A mechanism here specifies not only a decision rule, but also a testing function or testing rule. And our goal next is to simplify or pin down that testing rule. In order to do that, we need to define an order on the space of tests. So the crucial question is for a fixed type theta, when can one test tau replace another test psi? What do I mean by replace? Suppose the principal were currently assigning test psi to type theta. Could the principal instead use the test tau and then a possibly different decision rule to give the agent the same distribution over decisions? This sounds quite abstract, but it turns out the key to thinking about this is to think about a conversion from one test to another. Right? In the US, we think about you know, conversions from an ACT score to an SAT score. This is the type of thing we want to do between two tests. So starting with some test tau, we want to convert the score on test tau into an equivalent score 
on test psi. And then we're going to feed that equivalent score into the distribution, uh, into the decision rule that we had before. In our context, it's important that these conversions can be stochastic. So a conversion is really just a Markov transition. And I'm going to specify it here by only two probabilities. The other two are just complementary. So K1 is the probability that a passage on test tau is converted into a passage on test psi. And K0 is the probability that a failure on test tau is converted into a passage on test psi. So now we have our main definition of our order. Fix a type theta. The order is going to depend on this type. And we say that test tau is more theta discerning than test psi if we can perform this conversion. So if there exist two probabilities, k1 and k0, k1 needs to be greater than or equal to k0. So by passing test tau, you have a higher probability of having a converted score that's a pass. But now we have two conditions on this conversion that deal with incentive constraints. The first condition ensures that if type theta takes test tau, and the principal then converts test tau into a score on test psi, and then selects a decision as if the agent had gotten that score on test psi, then the decision distribution will be unchanged. So the left-hand side is the probability that type theta passes on this converted score. And we have to make sure this is the same as if this type just passed the original test. But we also have to worry about introducing new deviations for the other agents. So the second condition requires that for any other type, if, if any other type theta prime takes test tau, then after conversion, her passage rate is going to be weakly lower than it would have been if she had taken test psi directly. And it turns out that this is exactly the condition that we need. So first, uh, one quick definition. A testing function t hat is most discerning if for each type theta, it assigns to type theta a test that's more theta discerning than every other test. With this definition, we can state our main implementation result. So the following are equivalent. On the one hand, test t hat is most discerning. And on the other hand, for every decision environment, that is decision set and utility functions, every implementable social choice function is canonically implementable with this testing function t hat. So this allows us to pin down the testing rule without loss of generality. And if we do this, we can now induce an even simpler object. Suppose a testing function t hat is most discerning. Well, this means that without loss, we can assume that the report theta prime results in the test t hat of theta prime. And therefore, if type theta tries to mimic type theta prime, we know automatically what that passage probability is going to be, because the test t hat of theta prime is pinned down. So from this testing environment, we can define the induced authentication rate, which simply specifies the probability that type theta will pass if he imitates type theta prime, and it specifies this for every pair of types. But crucially, in the paper, we characterize which functions alpha can be induced in this way. Not every function alpha can be induced by a most discerning testing rule in this way. And this imposes structure on the primitive alpha, which is the approach taken in some of these recent papers on probabilistic verification. So now I want to turn to a quick application to illustrate what probabilistic verification can do, to, do for us and what results it can generate. Consider a very standard pricing setting with quasi-linear utility. The agent draws a type. We assume it has a decreasing hazard rate. The agent's utility from a quantity and a transfer, it's just quasi-linear. Quantities are real numbers here. So the agent has uh, a constant marginal utility from consumption, and that marginal utility is given by theta. And then the principal uh, gets the transfer from the agent and has some cost function C of production. That satisfies standard assumptions. In particular, C prime is strictly increasing and unbounded. Now we add to the standard setting an authentication rate. To keep the equation simple, I'm going to work with an exponential authentication rate, but the results hold more generally, just with more complicated formulas. So here, if a high type theta tries to uh, claims to be a lower type theta prime, then he's only authenticated or only passes with this probability here that starts at 1 if he's truthful and then decays exponentially as a function of the magnitude of his lie. 
the larger that lambda is here, the more precise the verification technology, and therefore the more rapidly the authentication rate decays as the agent of type theta reduces his report downwards. And it can be checked that this is one of those special alphas that can, in fact, be induced by a most discerning testimony. And now we can state the result. We're interested in the revenue maximizing mechanism that has to specify a quantity rule and a transfer rule. But here I'm going to focus on the quantities. It's a classical result that without verification, the revenue maximizing quantity is below the efficient level. And it's the solution to this equation. That is, the principle equates marginal cost on the left side with the virtual value on the right side. If on the right side we just had the value theta, that would be the efficient allocation. But when the principle increases the quantity that one type has, that allows higher types to, that requires higher types to have higher information rents. And in order to reduce those information rents, the principle distorts the distribution, distorts the quantity downward. What if we now have verification? Well, now uh, I'm just going to change this, just write out this 1 minus f uh, as an integral over the density just to, to make the comparison clearer. So now with verification, we equate the marginal cost not with the standard virtual value, but for, with a new augmented form of the virtual value. The key difference is the alpha here. So if alpha is always 1, that means that our verification technology is useless. It has no discriminatory power. And then the solutions coincide. But as the verification technology becomes more and more precise, this alpha term will shrink, which means the right-hand side will increase, and quantity will increase. So what happens here is the principle reduces downward distortion because increasing the quantity for a low type has less of an effect on the information rents of higher types. That, that effect is attenuated through the authentication rate. And in the limit, as verification becomes perfect and alpha goes down to zero, we see that we converge to the efficient allocation. So more generally, this example illustrates how using probabilistic verification provides a way of continuously interpolating between the classical private information environment in mechanism design and a perfect information environment on the other hand. Thank you. Exactly. So uh, I guess our answer to that would be if there is some sort of compound test, we would incorporate that in the test set T. Um, we think in some settings there are limitations on what testing can be done. I think this also ties into the evidence literature. There's often this question in the evidence literature, if you can give every piece of evidence you have, that's very different than if there are concrete pieces of evidence. So I think we follow the literature in thinking that uh, in many cases this is reasonable, but we can also incorporate it.